On my way up, I was listening to that Kate Brown podcast you did, and yeah. she gave <laughs> such a good intro. I, I, I was like, fuck, that's a glowing one. How, how am I even going to talk that? I don't know how she actually does that so well. She does it so well. I'm going to go the other way, and I'm just going to go... Welcome back to Radio Juxtapose, the podcast that gives you front row seats into the operating theatre as we dissect the art world. My name's Doug Gillen, and today I sit down with London-based artist Idris Khan at his studio in Hackney. Born into a medical family in Birmingham, his late mother a Welsh nurse and his father a surgeon from Pakistan. Idris's work explores a multitude of cultural influences ranging from classical music and photography to religion and philosophy. Through a layered process of repetition, objects and images take on completely new abstracted form, pulling the viewer in to find new meaning in the once familiar. Idris' practice transcends both form and scale, with his painterly work sitting in the gallery as comfortably as his large-scale architectural sculptures sit in the public. Well, we start this hour with more signs that fierce Ukrainian resistance is turning Vladimir Putin's war into what one NATO official is calling a stalemate. This is the refugee crisis worsens. Before we journey through the artist's life and career, we pick up the conversation in the middle of a fundraising print release in partnership with Migrate Art, raising money for the Disaster Emergency Fund, donating much needed money towards efforts in Ukraine. If you happen to be listening to this episode at the time of its release, you have until the 31st of March 2022 to get your hands on the Idris Khan Open Edition print. Similarly, here at Juxtapose, we've been running our own separate fundraising effort with a series of prints curated by the Ukrainian artist Favon Interesnikazki, with all the money going to the charity Save Ukraine Now. I really hope I've pronounced that right. Apologies if I haven't. Links for both releases will be in the show notes and on juxtapose.com. Thanks again to Simon Butler from Migrate Art for teeing this interview up with Idris. Enjoy the episode. I was going to start with the, the, the conflict in Ukraine, but I've, I've got to start a different way now. Why, how come your dog's called Pencil? So I've got two kids, uh, Maud and Jago, one's eight, one's nine. And I suppose you could probably call her a lockdown-ish dog. But I've, I've wanted a dog my whole life. And my parents, or my, especially my father, would never allow animals in the house. So I finally got a dog. And I guess, you know, two artists. Pencil, the pencil is the start of something. Is it not? It's the start of making something. You often start with a pencil when you're making a drawing. So yeah, she's like, I don't know, the start of something new for our family and she's just cute. And I think pencil's a great name for a for a dog. I, I mean, honestly, it, she helps uh, so much. I mean, you know, all the team love her. And it's it's funny because Annie, and my wife, who's also a, a, a great artist, she was, was the one that you know, was hesitant, I should say, of having a dog. It changes our life. You can't travel. And of course, now she's the one who's absolutely obsessed more than me. Of course, it goes that way. Of course, it does. As we're sitting here on Wednesday, you have had a print release up for a couple of days. And it is currently sitting at a grand total of... I think we've raised £115,000. <laughs> Which is pretty unbelievable. How does that feel? I can't express the sort of, like, the joy uh, it makes me feel, to be honest. I mean, like, just, I mean, I often talk about how art can sort of, it's got this, it's got this amazing uh, ability to rally people together. And it's, and it's, um, it's just amazing, like, the generosity and, you know, I'm just so, so, so overwhelmed by how quick that, that response has been. I'm sure it's got nothing to do with whether the, the work's good or not. <laughs> it's just people see something like, oh, yeah, great, I can get a piece of art. No, but it is, look, I mean, everyone's feeling the same, oh, I hope they are anyway, about the atrocities that are happening there and wanting to do something but perhaps don't know how or what to do. You know, not everyone's got a place where they can take in a refugee. Yes, there's places to donate money to. But sometimes those avenues are kind of even harder somehow. It's like, oh, you know, you just... It's nice to get something back somehow, like your hard-earned cash, and you're putting it into something, and you're putting it into a little bit of beauty that can go on on your wall, and you can actually be remembered about. It can, you know, make you remember about this time as well. And that's what art's got that power to do too. Actually, first of all, just for the listener, because this is it's always tricky with art, because we we're sitting, we're doing a, a sort of an audio-based medium, and 
we're talking about visual based work. So can you just rather than me trying to describe it, uh, can you tell us what the what the print is? Over the last sort of few years, I've been starting to do a lot of watercolor. I often have sort of lots of sort of um, sheet music around the studio and I just like put all sorts of different colors on it and I wash this sheet music and then I, and I almost make a sort of collage out of that. The image itself is uh, two pieces of uh, sheet music, uh, one yellow and one blue, which for me represented the Ukrainian flag. And it was a playful moment in the studio, to be honest. I think I just read a bunch of stuff on the news just before I got into the studio and I was like, God, I've got to, I've got to do something. What? And it, it, at first it just came up about me wanting to put something on Instagram to say, look, I'm against this. And like, you know, this is like, this is fucking awful, this situation. And it's like, I want to put my opinion forward. And it's like, you know, stop Putin or whatever. And so I just came in, I had these blue and yellow pieces of watercolor paper and I, and, and, and I layered one on top of each other and, and said, you know, there you go, stop Putin. And I put that out there and I, and I didn't think about it becoming a print or, or, or for sale to raise money. I just put it, put it out there as an image. And then I got a really lovely response and everyone's like, oh my God, this could be a print. Like, why don't you make it into this, this into a print? And then I immediately thought of, of, of Simon at uh, My Great Art because we uh, worked together a couple of years ago on uh, doing something for refugees and mainly Syrian refugees as well. And in a, in a, in an auction, and I just thought, you know, maybe this is something that he can do now, and um, and we can get it off the ground quickly. As an artist, do you find it tricky to come in and voice an opinion in quite a clear cut way? Because I think with a lot of artists, there's an ambiguity to the kind of the the messaging that they're presenting. Was there a kind of a little sort of cog ticking saying, "Hang on, is this the right way to do things?" Yeah, I guess I think speed was. The first thing, right? Because you want to get people's attention straight away. And when everyone's focused on this particular subject, because even even though that, you know, it's only been, what, two or three weeks since uh, Putin invaded Ukraine. So it's like, you want to get people's attention. You know that people want to react quickly. And, you know, can you, for me as well, it's like, well, can you make enough money to make a difference as well. And art market can be a very difficult thing, right? You've got, you know, ex very, very expensive things or really quite affordable things. But where do you sit in this, like as a print sale and where's your prints? How much are they in a sort of general market? And can you make them available to a wider audience so people react? So, you know, you've got to consider a little bit of balance, like you know, how many prints do you want out there? as well you know you've got to think about those kind of questions but we decided to do it as a as a, a 10 day release um which is kind of probably a new thing in the art market i, I don't know whether you in the realm of art history yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> yeah, in the realm of art history but just to have a, a limited time period where you can buy something rather than making a, an actual edition number and then for that to sell out um i think it made people react quicker somehow do you have a, just on that thread, do you have a number that you're like, actually, shit, this is, this is actually too many. I, I don't know if we've got the infrastructure for this. Like, it w wasn't just that. It was more to do with like my arm falling off about how many you'd actually sign in the end. <laughs> one of my friends said, what if you sell 10,000? I was like, nah, you'll never sell 10,000. Come on, let's be ridiculous. And then I suddenly think, oh, one of 10,000 sign two of ten. <laughs> but no i mean like you know hopefully it'll be in the hundreds what role do you think art plays in our ability to understand and influence the wider world another question that i have actually been thinking about over the last couple of days is is that you know when we talk about art and and you have to sort of like i suppose you have to categorize it in some way when you think about art you know do you think about visual art do you think about music do you think about sculpture do we think about poetry writing, books, literature. I mean, arts, it's everywhere. It influences everything. I mean, like, even if you're a... What if you're a speechwriter for a president? That's art, is it not? I mean, you probably have to... I know how many times, but it is... I mean, you, you know, it. It's there's so much power with everything in art. And it's like, I'm just a tiny part of that visual art, whatever. But, like, it just... It spans everywhere. So it's all amongst us all the time. I think it was at the start of the very first lockdown, there was the 
the first responders and the sort of the, the 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 most needed and valued people of society and then it was the ones that we can get rid of and we don't rely on during times like this and it was like artists and you're like well what are you sitting on your couch at, when you're locked in what are you watching what are you doing? You know, exactly what are you what are you what are you sitting on what are you like drinking out of it's it's the most ridiculous thing and like and and I, I like to make beautiful things. I mean, that's the first thing that I, I like to say. So, yes, when you put a print out there, it does have to capture people's imagination. For me, has always been about the first thing. Is it is it a beautiful object? And that can sort of, you know, grasp people's, uh, people's attentions quickly. Um, you talked a little bit about these, this sort of like cross-section of what we consider art. And music is, it's kind of, uh, certainly for a particular avenue of your art is very much embedded literally embedded into into the work can you talk maybe a little bit about this relationship that you have with music versus say the visual art and how does that influence what you're making my mother i grew up around music in the house she was uh she liked to play the piano you know she uh she played it very very well and um, sadly, she passed away uh, in 2010. And she's quite young, she's 59. There was always music sheets around the house. And I suppose that for me was the first sort of visual language that I knew and that makes me remember her. The reason that sort of, in a way, it became a music for me became about mark making. Is it important, the music that I use? Sometimes is, sometimes isn't. It's becoming less important now because I think that it's almost like, okay, I. I did a series of works with the with the four seasons that made sense because it was about lockdown it was about how we had more time to look at something and so and then the seasons were passing it made sense that I used that particular piece of music but I think for me it's sort of like I use musical notation because it's it's almost like trying to capture the rhythm of the the rhythm of making the painting or the rhythm of the world or the rhythm about my surroundings it's something like that, I think. It's sort of repetition and time. And I think time is the most important part of that because I think music represents time somehow. Would that work in your head if you had switched for... Because it's quite... It's grand music. It's it's weighted in austere history. Does that work then if you flip it to more contemporary references? You're right. I mean, I think that, you know, in the past using Chopin, Mozart... Wagner as well um, you know that is convoluted with history using more modern composers I suppose for me it doesn't really have that weight so I think it's important that it does still have a sort of weight of history that adds something intrinsic within it yeah because I think it becomes familiar for people if they you know if they see it then they respond I think using musical notation in the past has been about memory also and i think that music has that ability to do that so it you know it transports you to a different place a memory of that place if you like in that vein then do vi visual art have the ability for you to transport you to the same place that music can transport you yeah i mean photography does <laughs> definitely uh literally yeah. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> <Forgot that. laughs> well it tries to it of course it does it takes you back to that memory and i suppose i often think when i started to layer pictures that was almost trying to capture a lot of memories in one in, in one thing uh if you like so a, apart from one image taking you back to that particular place could i capture the whole journey in one object and that one object will then transport you to that entire passage of time rather than one instant which i would think what it is what photography does. I often think that you look at a picture of um, whatever, your night out, uh, and you look, okay, oh, yeah, I was there because you can see yourself and you're in that image. And it's like, oh, yeah, we were there. We all had a great time. And then you start thinking about that great time. What I try to do is, I, I suppose, look at like the length or passage of time um, captured in one instant instead. It's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a big concept. It is. Uh, early on, the first few images I made were to do with traveling around Europe or, or, or going on trips. Um, and more recently, I, I made a sculpture about photography and printing and time as well. I want to get into some of your, your, your public sculptures uh, yeah. in a minute. For me then, what was it about photography? You said that you had music as part of your, your sort of cultural upbringing. What, was there other uh, forms of art and culture in the house? Was your father influential in, in this 
respect. With that in mind, what was it about photography that was so interesting for you? <laughs> Honestly, uh, photography w was was my first tool uh, to express myself. I mean, that is the the bottom line, really. I I'm not a natural painter. I am not a natural drawer. Uh, in you know, I mean, Annie, she is. She can make anything beautiful with a line straight away. I struggle with that. I have to find, or I had to find another avenue where I could represent my ideas uh, conceptually. And photography gave me that opportunity. And I didn't grow up with with art and, and um, visual art in the house at all. Was that supported initially? Uh, there were moments where um, I, I, it was a medical household my father was a surgeon so i mean yes he definitely and he's from pakistan so he definitely saw the sort of more um the more employable uh things as uh you know to to do study medicine study law you know something have a have a path of a career so yes when i said i wanted to go and study fine art and photography at college it, there wasn't much resistance actually i think they saw some sort of talent in that you know but who who knows but i didn't i found i found my voice while I was at Derby University, I love making pictures. I love making big photographs. I loved making big mural prints. So um, that was something that, it, or something the physicality of a photograph. And then, um, and then, yeah, ended up at the Royal College. Did my masters down here in London, and and it was a that changed my life. Was there a sort of a, a, maybe even an internal pressure because photography as an art medium is a, is a it's a tricky one to kind of make work, but as a trade, it's, you know, there's, there's good work out there. Yeah. So was there that kind of like, hang on, maybe I could go do conflict journalism or something else like that, you know, we're, and we're watching just now, we're seeing like the value of these photographers and what they offer this, this like firsthand insight in there. You know, when I was studying, when I was studying photography, uh, there was a big boom of photographic realism you know there was like martin parr was like quite quite big back then and like um boris mikhailov who was a russian photographer he re i don't know there was like in your face reality uh using the photograph to really uh, using photography to really point your camera at something that's kind of hard to look at somehow documentary hard documentary and you know i was quite flowery you know in some way i was like i was in this you know, I liked being in the studio, re-photographing books or re-photographing things that already existed. So like, you know, appropriation was something that I started using quite early um, in in photography. So no, I didn't, I actually didn't have any idea that there was a, an art market gallery. I honestly didn't until I really came to London and I was amongst the art world. Before that, I had no idea that you could have a career as an artist. And I think the YBA has changed a lot of that. Mm. You know, I think that attention to artists and like that boom at that time suddenly made a lot of people think that, okay, they can do if, you know, if if luck and you know, it always takes a lot of luck and someone believing in you, if that can happen, then you can become an artist. So, but yeah, photography was always a battle against the other arts, I think, as well, because you know, a, a, a photograph can't necessarily get to the same levels as prices of paintings can, you know? So there's definitely a, in a way, a little lower market, the photographic market has, and for the people to take it seriously as well. And as you say, it's like photography is everywhere, right? I mean, even now it's like the amount of photography that's everywhere is insane. So to actually have, to be able to um, make a different type of picture and for people to look at it, then I think it's, it's hard. Was imposter syndrome anything something that ever kind of that crept up on you, especially in in these you know these institutions where everyone's kind of expected to be able to draw a portrait, a figurative portrait of a of a nude? Uh, was imposter syndrome something that you experienced, and if so, how did you combat it? I suppose, I suppose, yeah, definitely a little bit. I think when I was at the Royal College, anyway, it, it was a much smaller group of of artists being there. And I think I probably learned more from the artists that's, that I was surrounded by than I did from all the lectures that one was going to, to be honest. You know, I had really good people around me and like teaching me how to like, you know, to make a good, to make a good photograph. But it wasn't, it wasn't so strict as like, you could go off and sort of, 
paint on a photograph or you could do something to to change the way that you you practice your work i never i never felt that i wasn't sort of a and is that's kind of like you know are you an art <laughs> yeah because you can't do those things are you an artist you know it's like that's the question it's like because you can't paint because you know that's the medium that everyone sort of aspires to i never felt like i couldn't do it i just didn't at that time have the idea to do it and i think that it changed when i met annie actually and i had four years out of college and and she was like dude you've got a really good idea here like repetition time it doesn't have to just stop at photography just make something else <laughs> you know and, and and i suppose when you know when you know something so well it's like hard to change i think but like you have to kind of grow and adapt to mediums and then it didn't really matter what medium i was using to translate my ideas so then it became i became a lot freer i hope <laughs> after that period we've talked a little bit about annie so you guys share your studio you're in the same building you're married uh for 11 years longer jeez uh wait yeah sorry 11 years married 11 years i like that you like it feels a lot longer than that. <laughs> well if you think of, yeah 2007 we met got a couple of friends that have um are in similar relationships and i can see it from the outside that there's a kind of an internal competition is that something that you've ever had to face and how do you sort of you beat that inherent need to try and like keep your ego in check or something like that I mean, I can imagine that we've never, we, we've never had, we've never had, that's not actually a lie. I think we, of different careers and paths in art and timing in art um, are all different. And I think that sometimes it takes longer for some artists to be, not, I, I don't want to, I want to say recognized, but like timing and what's happening in the art world and the movements of people's fashions, if you like, to certain types of art change. But when I met Annie, I mean, she was still, you know, doing really, doing really well in, in, in her work, but she wasn't living in London. She was living in LA at the time. And she'd sort of left London to study in Paris and, and wasn't around the same trajectory as I had been in the early 2000s coming into like 2008 or nine, where there was like a London art scene and it was really booming and it was like sort of moving. So then when you come back into it, I think it can take it can take a while for you to find your feet and to be taken seriously in what you do. I think that's what it is. So like when we got together, it was like, you know, I was already working with like kind of big galleries in London and, and you know, Annie was looking for a studio and then she just like moved into the next door studio next door. <laughs> and she moved into my house after a month. <laughs> Invited. Yeah, of course. But, you know, and then it's, and then it's like, like you can have these moments and probably other artists have them as well. It's like, well, you have people coming to see my work. Why aren't they coming to see what I do? Or, you know, your works, why aren't they coming to see what I do? Or like, so there there was like, there's always, there was a slight bit of friction in that, you know? And then one, wondering whether you'll ever have a sort of certain same path or things like that. But then, and luckily and fantastically, it did happen. And now she's killing it. And I've never seen anything quite like it, to be honest. We both support each other. And, we both give each other ideas and we both have someone to talk about, talk at, whether it's just not just the making of the art, but the business side of the art world. And, you know, we have a great studio with lovely, amazing assistants around us. And it's, 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 you know, we have to talk about that as well, you know, so it's comes down to it in the end, it is kind of a business that we're both working on and like, you know, working with, I think we work between us, we work with like eight or nine galleries. So a lot of people to respond to. <laughs> I, I think that's funny as well, just seeing it as a business, because there's that idea of it just, oh, it's just art. I just create. I don't do I don't do this other thing. I just create. And having it can be quite a solitary experience doing this. So having someone there to be able to to kind of come up with these ideas and, 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 and say, hang on, this is good. This is gonna be a good move or this is a bad move. It doesn't work for everyone. You know, I mean, some artists have to be alone and um, and be in their studio alone and not really need to deal with anyone around them and things like that. You know, we and I think both Annie and I see it as uh, I think art, art, art can be very generous. Right. And it's like I want to be here on this planet and for as long as I am to make a lot of art. I love making it, I love doing it. And I need help to do that. I can't do it all alone. You know, I've got. You know, if you think about working with foundries or working with engineers, that collaborative side of art is great. And I love that. And we both have that passion to 
make something big as we can or make something, as, I don't know, like as well as we can. And it's quite nice to sort of share that, you know, it's quite nice to have a buzzy, you know, but some people can't, they have to be alone and they have, they can't deal with talking to galleries or anything like that, you know, but I think we like people coming to the studio and inviting them here and it's buzzy and there's a vibe and, um, and there's energy behind it. It's just good. We, we kind of briefly skirted over some of your, you mentioned your London photography public installation um, earlier. You've had uh, one in Dubai. As, as Abu Dhabi. Well. Abu Dhabi, sorry. How does that process change for you? Do you get the same out of it from doing something in the studio more intimately uh, versus something that is grand and on a completely different scale you know that i loved i love doing those type of projects they don't come i don't in a way i don't go out looking for them like i would never say that i'm a a sculptor so much um but i do have ideas that sometimes can become sculptures um and they're they're few and far be between i think getting public art sculptures they're, they're not easy to get um and i've been quite lucky that the ones i have got are quite big ones <laughs> i mean one, one being in abu dhabi it's like huge you know it's like 24 meters by 150 meters long and then suddenly i was asked to make a pavilion and, and it became like more of a, a massive architectural project mm -hmm. so it was, it was like well i never really thought it was going to be that big you know when i actually got given the brief you know but then it was like well why not kind of an interesting idea let's just go with it and run with it and in that process you start to work with architects and engineers and and it's really fun to have those kind of influences and in what you can and can't do in some way and it gives you restrictions as well you know and that's kind of a lovely conversation to have with those creative minds like problem solving i think i quite like problem solving in some way and then I, and then another time when i made a sculpture for for london there's this like eight meter sculpture made from photographs and that brings me back to the idea of layering time and and, and expressing time in, in a sculpture um, and to do with many moments becoming one. For the purposes of the listener, yeah. could you please just describe what this yeah, it's, uh, it's public art was? Meter, yeah, it's, uh, it's an eight sculpture. meter, it's an eight meter sculpture made in aluminium. You know, the idea of layering photographs uh, was something that I did at the Royal College and uh, left in 2004 about sort of layering time and compressing time. And then this sort of idea about the amount of photographs we take uh, today, you know, it's everywhere. It's on our phones and we're just snapping away like anything. And then one day I looked at it and I thought, well, how many pictures do I have on my phone? And I had like 65,000 pictures on there. And I was like, oh my God. I mean, that's like, I don't know. Can you, the question was, can you ever print that many pictures? And of course you would never do that, right? It, they just exist there and it's nice and you look through life and it flashes before your eyes. So I thought to myself, oh wow, what if I actually did do that? and made a sculpture out of it and how would that what 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 a what would it look like and how would it feel and it's almost like can i capture the sort of weight of time in photography in a sculpture um so i printed 65000 photographs and made a cast but the way it looks is it sits on a very small footprint so it sits on a 5 by 7 footprint and the idea of it escalating up so it starts on a small footprint and then escalates up to a 30 by uh, 28 inch block at the top. And the reason it escalates, because I was thinking about, well, how do you, how do you um, print photographs or the standardization of photographic printing? So you go into Snappy Snaps and you say, I want a six by four picture, I want a five by seven, I want a 10 by eight, I want to... So that gave me the idea of like blocks of, of, of these pictures going up in scale. So it's toppling, almost toppling on this sort of small little footprint that it's on. And so that, you know, then it escalates up and all you see are the edges of photographs. So imagine just stacking paper on top of each other, essentially. And all you see are these very detailed edges. As a viewer, you come up to it and you see this eight meter tower. In a way, it's a tower of time or representing time or the passing of time in a physical object. As a photographer, you know, you're working with a particular medium and there's maybe you have an attachment to it in a way that the average person doesn't have an attachment. So how has your relationship or the way you view this medium, do you think this is a healthy thing? Do you, do you find yourself having to step back from it, this disposable nature of something that you find quite like inherently special? I think it, um, it, 
it changes for everyone, right? I mean, I, I've had, I've got two kids, as I said, and you know, that is, that's your photographic boom when you have children. It's like, oh my God, I mean, how many pictures? They have, you know, they really do have a picture of every single day they were born. You know, it's nuts. So then it's like the explosiveness of sort of photograph, you know, everything has to be recorded, everything like that. I'm not, I'm not judgmental of how many people do that, but it is unbelievable. And I, I'm fascinated actually that, you know, like when you go like <laughs> to like these tourist locations and people have their selfie sticks and they're just recording every single second of that wherever they are like literally like that and like and then i just then i start thinking about ridiculous things like having that storage and like the cloud and like all that level of information there and it's like it's beyond like what i can conceive to be honest i don't i i don't know why one would want to to record their whole life like that and how has fatherhood changed uh you as an artist Oh God, has it? It has. Has it changed me? I'm not really sure whether it has or not. Um, okay, so maybe that's the, maybe that's the, <laughs> maybe that's the more diplomatic way of asking that question. Yeah, I mean, it impacts your. It makes you a little bit more focused, I think, um, for periods of of time, right? Because I have to be back. At, I can't like hang out in the studio until late, like like we used to, and can't just go out for like dinners and just like talk about art all the time. You know, it's it's it's, it's it changes the way that you focus your time in the studio, definitely. Sometimes it can be a it can be a helpful thing, but sometimes you're like, oh god, I'm I'm on this thing now. I actually want to just sit here and look at this painting. Obviously, you can't, but that's just the responsibilities of being a parent. They're very much part of our lives as artists. You know, they come everywhere with us. They they come to all the openings. We travel with them. We try to get them involved as much as possible. They moan about it. To be honest, they're not some. You know, <laughs> not got some, two accountants in the making. <laughs> exactly, they're literally going to be like. I, I think they should be art dealers. To be honest, way easier. We just bring everything in house. <laughs> yeah, you, it's not kids you're having. You're building an empire. Can't they just start? Can't they just start a gallery? How does then? Obviously, just that that idea of fatherhood, the the pandemic. How do these wider world situations feed in? Do you see them feed into? to your process and and how you make art yeah yeah very much i mean um i mean for, ex for example that this just in the last uh in the last uh when did i have the show last april uh in london i had a show at uh, a victoria Muir gallery which was very much about capturing our time in the pandemic um and and plastering all over the wall uh in color and it changed it changed my practice in a big way because i never really made much color work um, and then being forced to sort of, you know, Annie and I made the decision to, to leave London and go and um, spend time in Petworth in the English countryside. I think I briefly mentioned it earlier. We had a lot more time to look and um, the studio closed down, obviously, and everyone was in this situation where they had to only focus their amount of time for an hour a day and outside their house or whatever it was. But I think that nature and the colors, the changing colors of nature were way more apparent to me than they've ever been before. Or I was noticing them way more because I was in the English countryside. You know, suddenly you just see all these colors in the seasons and we were aware of the seasons. So I made a, a, a body of work about seasons changing and the colors changing within those, within those seasons to try and capture that year um, um, in the pandemic. It's funny because your work was quite quite monochromatic before and then there's really dark worldwide global events and then suddenly boom in comes color yeah it was almost like a sort of like quite nice a step away from all of that i mean I, you know what i was i was going i was we were, i remember it's like being obsessed with the five o'clock news you know but um and uh and, and and hearing all the updates every day and it was like again it was like negative 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 this and this and we didn't know what was going to happen and the world was changing all around us so fast and the whole world has changed um definitely and massively and it's like okay then there's this explosion of color because having more time to like look and understand it um was great You're listening to Radio Juxtapose in conversation with London-based visual artist Idris Khan. If you're enjoying this episode, please make sure you give us a five-star review or write some nice words wherever you're listening in from. Still to come on today's episode, we talk life, legacy, and a lot more. Let's get back into it right now on Radio Juxtapose. 
When you take uh, one of your, your stamp works and if you take an image, when you're creating this, so you've got, let's say, an image of some architecture, a city or the Quran. Uh, actually, I don't know. Is this the Quran? That's not the Quran. I'm pointing at something that's definitely not. <laughs> but it is I, a book. I pointed and then I was like, I don't think that's a Quran. That's uh, Roland Barthes' Camera Lucida. It's a very yeah, poignant book in photography. When you're creating these in your head, where are you? Are you th are you? Are you with this moment? Are you with this city? Are you with this piece of text? Or are you just thinking in technical places? So the, the, the stamp paintings which you mentioned are, just to describe them a little bit, what I do is I take passages of writing, um, usually my own, my own writing, and I make those into rubber stamps. So they exist, the first thing is that they exist as a piece of text. And that is for me is the engagement into what that will become, which will become a painting. Then I make rubber stamps um, here in the studio. I've got a laser cutter and there's loads behind me here as well. And they're quite beautiful objects, but they become the relics of those paintings. Um, so that moment of writing is the first engagement. And then as they become abstract paintings, that language gets eradicated. And for me, it goes away. And then they become a painting. Yes, in that moment of writing, there's my engagement. Then they go somewhere else. And they become these tools to then paint with. So then you're standing and looking at this massive abstract painting that's made of words. And I often get asked the question, they need to know the content. What is the content? What are the words about? And in the end, they don't really need to be about anything anymore. Because I think you can bring your own... In some way, I always say that you can bring your own baggage or you can bring your own thoughts or life to that particular painting. And then it's just left with colour, which is usually blue, and then an emotion. It doesn't really matter what I say anymore. Do you purposefully try to, to hold back from defining the artwork and the message because it might take something away from the viewer's experience? I think it would change the way that you look at the work. If I titled them... I mean, my titles are usually quite abstract or poetic in some way. And, you know, if I, I don't know, if I told you like, okay, you've got to look at this painting now. And oh, by the way, it's about how I hate Donald Trump. You know, you're going to think, oh, I don't know what you're going to think. You're going to, it doesn't really matter, does it? I mean, it's like, you know, is it, <laughs> it's like, do you want to, do you care about my political views? No, you don't. You want to look at a beautiful painting and, and stand in front of it and sort of just, in a way, that painting could then become anything you want it to become. I don't want to dictate you into how you're supposed to be feeling when you look at it, just because of those words could be about something like that. What piece or project are you most proud of? Oh, my God. Um, oh, that's really tough. And there's so many different um, things that come with it. I think the achievement of making that massive monumental sculpture in Abu Dhabi was a huge effort I made a massive sculpture as well as fully landscaping a 55,000 square meter park in eight months. So it's like, I'll never forget that moment. And I don't think I'll have anything like that again. So that was like a huge effort. I was making it between Australia, China and um, Germany. So we were like flying every two weeks to one of those locations, you know, and it took me away from my family, all that, all that, energy that was expelled in that project was something I'll never forget. So that was a huge deal for me. But there are other moments that I've had that I'll never forget, which is when I started making stamp paintings. And the reason I made those stamp paintings was because I had a period of grief in my life, which was my mother passing away. And then in the same year, Annie and I losing our first child through stillbirth. And there's that moment where I was like, wow, how do I get rid of this grief or this period of grief? And there was like, okay, I'm going to start writing and I'm going to make those writing, I'm going to make those words into stamps and I'm going to make drawings from them. So that was like, yeah, that changed the way that I make art. So that's a huge moment, you know? So those, I suppose those two, I'm proud of those two moments. And do you still get that kind of, that sense of a cathartic experience throughout that, even though... You know, you are now, you know, you're far away from where you were, you know, when you were in art school, you're, this is a business. Mm -hmm. you, are you still able to, to make sure that you get that experience through there? Yeah. And I think that, um, 
I put myself in a position where I always like to adapt and change whether it's I don't ever if I feel too comfortable in a in a paint like or a process of painting or too comfortable with the way that I sort of like make make the work if you like I always like to try and change that up and that gives you fresh ideas and understanding of course like you know as things grow and you have more shows and you know I think artists have this <laughs> this uh unfortunate um, thing where they like to say yes to everything because <laughs> mm. you never know it's like is this the last job offer i'm gonna get yeah. i think it always stays with you somehow it's like yeah. shit if i say no to that then my whole world's gonna fall and collapse yeah. so i never like to say no so there's always like, you know i mean you sh one should because uh, you have a lot more time i think i think grayson perry said that to me once he said uh you know I, it was the best is it's the best thing to do to say no to stuff because it actually just opens up a whole different thing but I like, we like to keep ourselves busy and you know, Annie's so busy at the moment as well. And we've got so much going on. It's just like, you're on this, this you're on this path now. You may as well just keep it going and like, you know, expel the amount of energy that you can to something that you love doing. And I mean, art is such an amazing privilege. You're so privileged to be an artist and to make money from what you do. And like, I'm never going to give that up. When were you, when were you the most or the furthest from your comfort zone? Oh God. I think that I think making starting to make paintings was probably the first moment because I, I, I you know I knew I knew f photography so well I knew the layering process of, of, of you know using Photoshop scanning using cameras and then like the ability to then go into making a painting and also a process of painting and and you know I like to I like to really um exhaust an idea somehow to the point where I need to know absolutely everything about that color or um, the way that that painting's made. And the, I, that's probably quite a generalization here, but I think there's a lot, a lot more decisions that are made in painting in some way than, than a photograph detail wise energy expelled that's big yeah, I know that's that's a big sweep. that is a big sweeping statement i think i just in terms of the sort of like the control that you have on a computer screen and and, and in a photograph is different to then making a painting an object somehow i think that like the color choices are so you can't just go back you know you've got to get it right so the amount of experiment for even the background like you see in the studio just there that color this new color that I'm working with, which is like copper blue color. I mean, the amount of tests I've done to get that color right is like nuts. Whereas like, you know, in some way on a computer, you're like, okay, that way, that way, that way. Then you do a printing process, then you can kind of tweak it there. But then you've engaged so much on a massive panel, like that painting and like, you know, the time that it's taken to make that background. And then you're like, oh, fucking shit. You know, <laughs> it's not a quick go, it's not a quick turnaround, you know. When is a color right? when it's when it's when it when it's moving somehow I mean, how, how do i explain that when it's when it uh take I mean, i'm doing lots of experiments can you see those two little blue things you can't see that as views i'm sorry but there's two little blue um panels in the middle of that other color i'm trying to complement those that copper blue color with another blue in the room so i've got a show in los angeles in september um and I love an organic plug. Oh uh, God, I know, I, I, I know, I, it, but it, uh, just in terms of talking about yeah, the, yeah, the, no, that's good. Usually we have to force it at the end, like tell me what you got coming up. You're like, oh, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm hoping that's happening. That my gallery in New York's opening a gallery there. I'm the first show, but it's like they've got. I want four panels on the right hand side of the room and four panels on the left. So I need to complement that copper blue color and then get the blue. I started off on one blue, and now we're three weeks later into this <laughs> little these two samples, which I think now I'm happy with. But it has to, it has to either, especially using color, what are you trying to get the viewer to look at? Is it to lift you? Is it to make you bring you down? What state of being are you going to be in that room? And that is what I'm trying to get in those colors. A balance between these two, there's this kind of up and this down. Yeah, yeah. And I think I found the, way I, the blue that I've been making for the last sort of four years or so is a very specific blue because it, it really does have a feeling of, whether you're in that state of whatever state you're in when you come to it that's how you feel up or down we talked a little bit just off mic about legacy and I, i'm interested just as 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 an artist and where you are is this something you've begun thinking about is is it something you've always thought about how does legacy play into into your mindset 
Um, you can be honest if it doesn't. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 do I think... I, I, know, I don't know whether I think about that <laughs> eventuality. <laughs> but I think about... I do think about the different points of engagement that you have as an artist with a different type of viewer. So, you know, I think a lot of artists' careers probably they do want to go into more museum shows and and have that engagement with a much wider audience. You know, I think that you you can have lots of commercial shows with your with your galleries, but I think that that engagement of a much bigger presentation and I've just another plug (laughs) I'm hopefully gonna (laughs) I'm hopefully gonna have a show at Milwaukee Art Museum in October 23 and it's been I've been working on it for the last three years and it's going to be sort of like a mini survey show you can't call it a retrospective because I'm far too young Um, but uh, it's a survey exhibition of 20 years of work and I've had I've had smaller museum shows um, where I've sort of touched on looking back at all the work that you make but it's a fantastic process to be able to look back at, and see where you are by looking and showing all your work. So I've never really thought about, in a way, how that might change what I make in the future. It's just a lovely thing to look back and consolidate what you've been making and seeing those differences and changes in, in, in your work. And the only way to do that is a massive museum show. <laughs> We've covered some really, really nice ground in this. And then the only other thing is, you know, as an artist, it's kind of this that's flirted with so many different scales and mediums. What is the the sort of the untouched uh, avenue that you want to? Is there something in the back of your head that you like? This is it. This is the thing that I want to to you know, engage with and figure out how to create and using this medium? Is it physical? Is it digital? You know, weirdly, (laughs) it is physical. Um, I've never really been much of an oil painter, right? And for some reason that, I mean, it sounds small in some way. Okay, yes, I've done these great big projects and and I want to continue doing big, public artworks I really love that process but like I don't know I've never made a painting with just a brush that figurative female (laughs) that we talked about earlier getting back to that point and I don't know whether I I, I, whether I will or whether I need to but I mean I think that is somehow like it is an aspiration to perhaps do that nice would that be like a recreation of of your other works or would it be something completely different it's just something different you know I mean like it's it yeah I don't know really don't know what it is but it's 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 something like it's a progression like do I need it's like you ask your question all the time you know yes I've been I've been using stamps for a long time now and music and 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 with text and all different texts Arabic text all that kind of stuff and like here we are with this tool of, of, of printing and this cathartic process but can I get back can I one day just go okay this is and I always talk about like and Annie and I always talk about something it's like well have you earned it and I, I think that's an, it's an interesting question it's like you've got to earn that you've got to earn that from a journey that you've had as an artist you've got to earn that single line I remember like Miro um, you go to Miro Museum uh, where is it uh, it's in Barcelona um, and you go around and then at the very last room, you see one of his paintings that is just one single line that's not finished. And he earned that. You know what I mean? He earned it by doing everything he did. He earned that line in the end, at the end of his life. It just can. Thank you so much for your time. Idris's print to raise funds for Ukraine's disaster relief emergency will be available until the 31st of March. You can find a link for that in the episode show notes. Alternatively, be sure to cast a little eye over the juxtaposed print releases, which will be available just that little bit longer until April. I'd like to say thank you once again to Idris for being so generous with his time. I can't wait to see what he has coming up in the future. And once again, a shout out to Simon Butler from My Great Art for making this happen. Today's episode was hosted and edited by myself, Doug Gillen. Evan Preco will be back with us, no doubt, in the next episode. I certainly hope so. It's been a while since we've been on one together. Wherever you're listening in from, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. We'll be back with you guys real soon. Till then, take care of yourselves and each other. <laughs>